Okay, we're on chapter two of The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli. Let's get to it. Okay. May came in with a burst of bloom in hedge and field. There was hawthorn, both pink and white, and primroses and buttercups carpeted the fields with yellow. In every garden, wallflowers blossomed in bright color and filled the air with perfume. For days, Robin was cared for as if he were a little child. Brother Luke brought him food, kept him washed, and changed his clothes. But he was too much occupied with other things to stay with Robin for very long at a time. The bells clamored as loudly as ever, but now the sound was associated with the regular procession of the monks going to devotion. Robin grew to like it. He began to sleep well on the hard cot and to feel at home in the little cell. He could see nothing but the sky through the small wind hole, for it was high in the stone wall and only in the early morning allowed a ray of sunshine to come in. Against another wall stood a prayer stool and desk combined with a smaller one beside it. On the wall hung a little cupboard, which held Brother Luke's few personal belongings and his bravery. Robin couldn't see into the corridor, and at first couldn't identify all the sounds he heard. He liked the shing sound of feet on the stone as the monks passed to and fro. Sometimes when they passed in procession, chanting, he joined in the singing, for most of the plain songs were known to him. Sometimes there were long silences when he heard nothing but the mewing of the cat, Millicent, or the squeaking of the mouse she had caught. <laughs> there were hundreds of people within the hospice, but, there were separate, but they were separated by thick walls and long passages. The outer court was far away, at the other side of the monastery. There, visiting pilgrims, knights at arms, merchants, and minstrels gathered, each awaiting the attention of the prior. Because there were few inns, the monasteries were open for the entertainment of wayfarers, rich and poor alike. Beside that portion reserved for travelers, there was an almonry overflowing with the poor of London, seeking food and clothing. St. Mark's was a busy place, but most of the activity was far away from Robin. He was much alone, and time seemed long. One day, Brother Luke said, It is time now to try the sitting up. He was rubbing Robin's legs as he did every day, talking the while. If thy hands are busy, time will pass more quickly. Time will pass more quickly. <laughs> Dost like no whittling? Mm -mm, forgive me. Dost like to whittle? Of course, answered Robin. Of course. Who does not? but I have naught to whittle. I shall find thee a piece of soft pine and will lend thee my knife. Tis sharp and of good steel. This bench will fit against thy back to support thee. Brother Luke set the oaken bench at Robin's back and fitted a cushion for his comfort. Can I make a bow? asked Robin. Can I make it now? Brother Luke nodded and left the cell. It seemed long before he returned. Finally, he brought the knife and the piece of pine he had promised. It felt smooth and clean to Robin's hands, and he liked to watch the small white shavings peel off. At first, he scarcely knew where to begin to bring out the shape of a boat. But little by little, he began to round out, and at one end, a point began to appear, 
as if it had been a prowl. Perhaps I can make it into a sailing boat like the fishermen bring to Bellin Grave, or a barge such as the king uses, he said. Perhaps when it is done, I will be able to walk and go to the Thames to sail it. Perhaps, agreed the friar. It was very exciting, but Robin had to stop often to rest. Brother Luke brought up some soup in which dark bread was to be supped. Robin didn't want any of it. He wanted only to go on with his whittling and turned away from the food. But tis made of good mutton in which bay and marigold have been seethed, Brother Luke coaxed. Brother Michael grows those fragrant herbs in the garden. Bay is tasty and gives good appetite. Marigold is said to be of the value against poor sight and angry words. It is said, twill dawn evil humors out of the head, and the flowers make fair garlands, for maidens become of their golden color. What cared Robin for garlands and, make and maidens? What cared he for fragrant herbs? Soppy food he despised. <laughs> Brother Luke looked patient, said nothing, but continued to hold the food ready, and Robin gave in. He drank the soup and ate the dry bread. Because he had something interesting to do and to think about, Robin found the days passing more quickly. He began to recognize sounds as he had done before and to associate footsteps with differing gates, with the people to whom they belonged. Now and then, one of the monks would look in on Robin to give him cheer or to say an of. So he knew several of the monks' names. He could tell which of them was passing. Brother Andrew he knew because he dragged one foot a little. Brother Thomas walked very swiftly, heel and toe, toe and heel, whistling tunelessly under his breath as he went. Brother Paul was a large man, and when he walked, when he walked through the corridor, the thudding of his feet seemed to shake the walls, heavy as they were. <laughs> Besides, one of his shoes squeaked. Robin worked steadily at his little boat. He finished the hull on the fourth day of the second week. I see this is to be a sailing boat after all, instead of a barge, said Brother Luke. It is somewhat awry, with the bow a slant from the stern, but it hath an air as if it had been battling the storm. Brother Luke brought small slender pieces of pine, showed Robin how to smooth them into mast and bowsprit then found scraps of linen for sails and pieces of yarn for the rigging. He even begged a scrap of silk ribbon from a traveler for Robin to use as a pennant for the masthead. As if the toy boat had belonged to the king's fleet, Robin thought, <laughs> Robin thought, sorry. Never before had Robin done anything of the kind for himself. Always one of his father's retainers had made what toys he had. One Rolf had made him a hobby, hobby horse, and one Alfred, the Dane, had made him a boat. But it had not seemed so fine as this one. Now he could hardly want, I'm sorry, now he could hardly wait to begin something else. He would like to carve one of those dwarves, for example, such as those in the roof bosses in his father's house. Brother Luke suggested something easier. <laughs> Patience, my son, he said. It takes great skill to carve figures like that. Why not make a simple cross? Twill be fitting to hang over thy cot 
if tis well made and smoothly finished. I'll find some pieces of wood and will show thee how to begin. Always while Brother Luke talked, he rubbed away at Robin's legs and then turned himself, I'm sorry, turned him and smoothed his back. Busy as he was, Brother Luke found time to bring Robin the pieces of wood he had promised. These I saved from the pruning of the walnut tree that stands by the well, he said. It is weathered, for it hath lain in sun and rain these many months. And how shall I fasten the pieces of the cross together, asked Robin. Shall I nail it then, or how shall it be done? When thou art ready for that, Brother Matthew will show thee, answered the friar. Now make it smooth and fine, and have it well proportioned, for it will be a keepsake and not a toy like the little boat. That I leave to thy judgment, for tis part of the joy of making things. Each day the pieces of the cross grew smoother and better shaped. For Brother Luke would examine them and show how they were too wide here or too uneven there. Each day, too, Robin grew stronger and would work longer before resting. The knife fitted his hand and obeyed his thought more truly. One or two cuts on the fingers had taught him caution. Many times Robin, the short, many times Robin held the shorter piece of wood, crossed the longer piece to see how long it would look, and at and would ask, "Isn't it time now to put them together?" But each time, Brother Luke's finger sought out rough places that must be rubbed down with pumice. Brother Luke was busy all day caring for the sick and the poor. From vespers until early bedtime, he served his turn in the scriptorium where all the writing was done. Once he had carried Robin to another part of the monastery and showed him where records of everyday living were written and poems of psalm trees copied psalteries, that is. Each monk had a small enclosure of his own where he could be quiet to do his work. Brother Luke set Robin down beside him at the oaken bench in his own particular place where he could spread out the pages of handwritten manuscript on which he was working. The pages were sheepskin called parchment and were covered with careful lettering and decorations. Gold leaf illumined the capitals and the delicate tracery which bordered the pages. Robin wished he had known how to read, how to read what he saw. He wished he could dip the quill into the ink pot and inscribe letters and draw pictures such as Brother Luke had done. Will you teach me to read? asked Robin. We were taught singing at the brother's scroll, but I know not writing. Will you teach me that? Yes, my son, truly I will, when there is not so many people to care for. But come now, back to thy cot. First, we shall stop to say a prayer in the chapel for thy strengthening. He lifted Robin to his back again and started down the corridor. In some places, the passages were so crowded it was difficult to get through without stepping on someone. Old men and women in pitiful rags sat hunched against the wall or lay upon pallets. Among them went the brothers of the order and sisters from the priory nearby, cleansing and feeding, dressing and comforting them. Ill-clad children ran about, and a small girl child 
clung to brother, brother Luke, and begged to be carried. A boy, not much older than Robin, came hobbling toward them on crutches. He smacked Robin as he passed and saluted him, seeing how Robin's legs were lame, even as his own. <laughs> Good eve, Brother Crookshanks. I'm sorry, Brother Crookshanks. He cried, laughing as if it had been a great joke to be lame. I see I have good company. Robin's anger rose at the familiarity. Keep your filthy hands off of me, loot, he shouted. Hounds meet? I am no mere crook shanked than you. But even as he spoke, Robin was considering the crutches and thinking how convenient they would be for himself. Then he remembered that even yet his legs would not support him for a moment. Brother Luke scolded the boy, but laughed too at Robin's anger. Fie on thee for an, impet for an impertinent lad. Still, Crookshanks, he is truly. His legs will be as good as thine one day, boy, and then he shall keep thee company right enough in his feet, on his feet. He went on toward the chapel, speaking to Robin over his shoulder as they went. The lad meant, to, meant no offense when he called thee Crookshanks, Master Robin. Tis but the way we all are named, for some oddity we have, and for, there, for where we live, or for what we do. This boy is called Geoffrey Atwater, because he lives by the river fleece and tends to conduct there with his father. He was so called before he limped as he does now. Oh, said Robin, I wondered why he is not called Geoffrey Crookshanks. Now I understand. <laughs> Brother Luke went on to speak of other names and how they began. Now I was called Chansa because my father was a shoemaker. For, no, but since I have taken a vow to be a monk and to serve our Lord wherever I, must, wherever I am most needed, I've taken the name of Luke, the physician in the gospel. And my father is Sir John de Buford because he came from that place. It is that, is that the way of it? asked Robin. That is the right of it, agreed the friar. When Geoffrey called thee Crookshanks, he did it because thy legs are thy legs and no others. Richard Small Trot is he with the short step and not Richard Crowfoot, whose feet splay out like fans. Robin laughed. They went into the chapel. It was very, it was empty, being between time of service, times of service. Brother Luke placed Robin on the stone seat, bordering the wall, propping him against the column, which rose high to the vaulted roof. Say there thy prayers, he directed, and in thy mind, know thou on thy knees. Forget not to be thankful for all thou hast. Remember thy lady mother and Sir John, thy father, who art at the wars, and pray for us all. Then he left Robin and went apart to his own devotions. But what have I to be thankful for, Robin thought rebelliously. How will my father like a son who is called Crookshanks? But somehow, as he began his prayers, he felt better. That is the end of chapter two, and I thank you for your patience as I read some of the old English verbiage that is in this book. I'm grateful that I didn't know that it was written this way, or else I may have um, decided not to do it. And now I know why it hasn't been done in all of YouTube land. <laughs> I'll see you again in chapter three.